Hey guys, Alex here from the DMs Club on the Titan Bear Gaming YouTube channel. Today's video is Dungeon Mastery 106. This is the last of the pillars of adventure that we've been talking about, and this one is combat. If you've been following along, then you probably have an adventure module that you've been thinking about wanting to run. You've converted it into a, into a plot map or a flow chart of what all the different pieces are for the story and what goes into each of those pieces in terms of actually running it. You've been mapping them out into whether they're part of exploration pillar of adventure, are you exploring? Are you describing uh, unique and fantastic worlds for your characters? Are they going to be trying to interact with those worlds and how do they do so? Is it social role play where they're talking to townspeople or interesting NPCs, characters in the story that you, the dungeon master, will play that has some kind of relevant information for the party? Or not, they could be entirely irrelevant characters that are just there for fun and just to help give a little bit of realism to the story. And now we're on to our third pillar of combat. This is going to be any time that you've got monsters that your that your adventurers are going to be fighting up against or if this is the villain of the story for finally coming to some resolution for the plot anytime that you're going to be fighting we're talking about combat now combat can be perceived as a little bit tough and as a little bit complex in terms of the rule space that's involved but fortunately you don't need to know that many rules for this video I'm going to try to do the same thing that I've been doing for my other videos where I try to boil it down to these the barest essentials of what rules you need to know to give you a level of structure for getting started with this at your first game, to run your first game table. So let's go ahead and get into it. You're going to figure out the specifics as you go and as you get better at this over, uh, over the course of your dungeon mastering career, but you need somewhere to get started from. And with this information, you'll have just enough to get going. So the first detail for running combat in your game is preparation. What do you got to do to get ready to run combat? You've been looking at your module and you can see that there's monsters that are going to be showing up and you want to get ready to actually run that combat encounter. There are only a couple of things that you need. The first piece is to familiarize yourself with the monsters themselves that, you, that your ad adventurers are going to be fighting up against. The easiest and best way to do this is to pull out your monster manual and reference the monster stat blocks that come for the monsters in question. Now when you're looking at these things, you don't really need to digest too much information about the stat block. For the most part, you just need to print it out or take a photocopy or a cell phone picture or something like that and just have it for a reference material on hand because actually playing the combat encounter you only really need to reference this occasionally or have like a printed form that you can take notes on or something like that. That's my usual style. I'll take a photocopy of this into a, a piece of paper and then write notes directly on it so I can throw it away at the end of the encounter. But when you're looking at the stat block you just kind of want to refresh yourself a little bit on what kinds of things the monster will do. So the one that I'm looking at here from the monster manual is the ogre. Just be re uh, refreshed on things like the hit points, how much total hit points the thing has, what its general armor class looks like, what languages does it speak in case your players want to try to talk to the creature. And the part that you want to focus on most, first and foremost, are the actions section, or if there's any kind of special powers or anything. Some of them are going to be more complicated than others, and you can deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. That's much of what dungeon mastering is, is learning on a case-by-case -case basis. But for this one, we've got a great club that does attack damage, bludgeoning damage. It tells you what the bonuses are to hit. The fact that it has reach, hits one target, does bludgeoning damage when it actually does land, as well as having this javelin attack that says it's both melee or ranged. And it also gives you a hit, has a reach, and then tells you what the range is on it. And so for me, as the dungeon master getting ready, for this, I would remind myself, okay, this ogre is walking into battle. He's going to be smacking things with his club. And in the off chance that he's at range from someone, or if he wants to try and take a shot at the wizard or the healer in the back, he can hurl a javelin, this mighty javelin over there to try and make a weapon attack against him. And that's it. That's about all that you need to prepare yourself for going into the combats. We can think about strategy as much as you want, but honestly, that's a more advanced topic that wants to have its own separate video segment. And for now, now all you really need are the basics of how do you behave as these monsters when you're actually running the, the, the battle map. Before we get to the battle map, you're also going to want to have some kind of miniatures representation for the monsters that you're going to be using. You can either use actual minis by Reaper or by WizKids or 3D printed ones or whatever you'd like. Anything will work. You can even use the printed Pog ones from Paizo or any of these cool acrylic ones that are now out. We could do a whole episode on minis and I probably will do a whole episode on minis because minis 
minis are great and I love them too much. But you can just as easily use pieces of candy or spare dice or something else, something to act as a token to represent the monster on the battlefield. So speaking of battle map, let's talk about that. That's the next and last piece of prep that you need to do before actually getting into running a combat encounter in your game. You need to have a map that you're going to be playing on. Now, a lot of people will say that you can run with theater of the mind and you can where you don't use a map and you just keep things uh, mentally track of where things are at. And that's cool if you want to start that way, then I really encourage you to do so. That's a perfectly fine way of doing it. For new players and new uh, dungeon masters, I do recommend going the battle map option for actually having a physical layout of the combat so that you can, so that the miniatures themselves keep track of, of positionally where things are located so that you don't have to. So anyway, with a battle map, you have a bunch of different ways that you can do it, but it all both ultimately boils down to the basics of you need to now draw out a map to represent the space that the battle is going to take place at, so that where, your, where your adventurers are going to fight the monsters. In most of the printed modules, it's clear. They give you map handouts in the pages of the book to say, in this room, you're going to fight three Nothics. In that room, there's six goblins and a bugbear, at which point all you need to do is make a slightly larger version of that or to actually print the map out on a larger piece of paper using a one inch grid ruled system. Or you can just draw it out on either a battle map or on some other kind of piece of paper or whatever. What I find most people end up using for this, especially when they're first getting started, is one of these Chessix battle map products that exist. This is a one inch grid ruled uh, special vinyl sheet that you roll out onto your table. It can uh, use erasable markers. They have to be wet erase markers, not dry erase markers. Um, and you'll just draw your map directly on this guy, lay them out, put your miniatures out or whatever, and then begin your combat with it. This is what mo a lot of people start with, I find that a lot of people move away from these. They either get tired of using the wet erase system or they don't like how it's only a single monolithic piece of paper, a vinyl sheet, that you then have to try and uh, expose pieces of it at a time as your players are walking through a dungeon or something else along these lines. I don't actually like using this myself. I usually leave this out as a base on my table just to remind people that we will be using a grid-based system. But I like to use something different. What I like to use is the, I like to buy easel pads of one inch grid ruled paper that ends up coming out to be about this big or so. Let's see, that's actually the full size of the screen here. It's a really big easel pad and I like to draw the map pieces that we're going to be fighting on or whatever directly on there and then I cut them out to fit so that I can just set these pieces of paper down as the adventurers are going into them or whenever we're going into the combat. And I like doing it because using the white paper that has a one inch grid ruled system on it, the grid is present so you can still use it from a reference perspective, but you can use nice thick markers to draw your terrain features and to kind of let the grid fade to the background of people's attention so that you kind of forget that you're playing in a game and you can get a little bit better degree of realism. Now, I'm really sad because I actually ran out of my easel pad paper for the last game that we were playing in, but because it's the holidays, we're now in Christmas time. I think we're actually like three days away from Christmas right now. Holy cow. But I found an interesting discovery last night as I was wrapping presents. A lot of these wrapping papers that are now being dis uh, distributed around the country have a one inch ruled grid system on the back. It's interesting that they have this. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna keep this in mind and stock up on some extra wrapping paper <laughs> tubes so that I can have some spare grid paper for whenever I'm gonna be doing my battle mats. Interesting thing, there's a whole bunch of different products that you could do. There's a bu bunch of products you can use. There's clay paper, there's dry erase tiles that you can interlock together. Like I said, we can make an entire video on the different battle map systems and there's 3D printed stuff and oh my God, there's all kinds of cool stuff. But the bottom line is you just need to have some kind of map to put out for your players so that you can put your minis on it and it communicates the details of the environment that you're going to be doing your combat in. And it's always a good idea to kind of sprinkle in some kind of interesting terrain environments of difficult terrain sections, some rubble or some trees or some vines or something, or to have different levels to have ramps or steps or something to go different places just to shake things up a little bit. But once you've got your map, once you've got your miniatures that you're going to use for your enemies, and once you've got an idea of what those monsters are, you're ready to begin combat. 
Now for running combat, there's a bunch of different rules that apply and there's kind of a system that you're going to use as the dungeon master for running the combat. And it may seem complicated at first glance, but it ultimately boils down to four basic questions, okay? And those questions are as follows. Who goes when? both player characters and monsters alike. Where are you relative to one another on the map? How do you attack each other and how do you kill each other when you're on the map? And when does combat end? How do things die in the game? If you can answer these four questions, which we're about to do, you're gonna be set to run combat yourself. So first up, who goes when? This is what this is what's called the initiative system in fifth edition and in most prior versions of Dungeons and Dragons. And basically all role-playing games use some variant of it. This is to help you sort out who gets to go when, who takes their turn when. Combat is done as a turn-based thing in the initiative system. And usually the way that this is signified to actually begin combat is going from kind of your storytelling style to move into the initiative system. The dungeon master usually tells the players to roll for initiative or to make an initiative roll. And then it's done like a normal D20 where they add their bonus to their initiative rolls, etc. And then what you do is you just order the players and the monsters in descending order from whoever rolled the highest down to whoever rolled the lowest. And then you're going to go one person or monster at a time down this list, taking their turns round robin. Each, each full rotation through the list counts as one round. When you get to the bottom, you just restart back up at the top. There's only a little bit of fanciness that can happen in this initiative order system. And that's for things like when players want to deliberately wait to do something until some other kind of triggering event happens. In the simplest case, it's, oh, I want to wait until Janet is gonna take her turn. She's gonna do an attack, I'm gonna do an attack. We're gonna be best friends together and do our attacks at the same time. That's cool, you just wait until the person, the other person is gonna go, the other person taking their turn is the triggering action for that, and then you can let both people go at the same time. Don't mess with the initiative ordering system, just say, okay, I'm gonna wait until this person goes. That's all you gotta do, it's fairly easy to track. Otherwise, you may do things like, if you have a fancy monster encounter where you've got a bunch of bats or something, or cloakers or some kind of flying creature that may be swooping down to attack the party, your fighter who just has a sword is not going to be able to take his turn to go and make a, a, a melee sword attack against these swooping in creatures. And so that fighter may decide that they say, okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold my action until a monster comes down and swoops at me. Then I'm going to take a timed strike to try and hit them as they come down. That's fine. Just have them wait until the triggering action happens. The way that it usually goes is you wait until the triggering action and then whoever's held their turn is that takes their attack, their action first before the triggering thing takes effect so that you can beat them to the punch and still get the benefits of having gone first in the initiative tracking system. But otherwise, that's how your normal rounds of, of combat are going to progress. Each person takes their turn, one person at a time, remind the next person who's up so that they can kind of get their thoughts straight for what they want to do on their turn. But you just round robin it all the way through and then, and then uh, recharge back up to the beginning every new turn. So the second question to understand for combat is where are you? This is why we use the battle map style to have miniatures out there with a one inch grid system to denote who's where and who can see each other and are you within range of doing effects and how do you move. So that's what this section covers, movement and generally manipulating the grid system. Now for a movement speed, you'll notice that on your character sheets, you've got things that say 30 feet or 25 feet or 50 feet or something like that. And those are all measured in per round. Now, if you're using the one inch grid system, then that uh, assumes the relation that one square on that grid is equal to five feet of movement. So if your character wants to move in a round and they've got a movement speed of 30, that means that they can move up to six squares on that round. Pretty simple, right? A lot of people like to use, if you're gonna go diagonals, that that costs one and a half times the movement. So it would be one and a half squares to get into the first square, and then three, a second increment of one and a half for the second square. And so it costs a little bit extra to move each time. But honestly, I think it's a little bit optional. I know a lot of dungeon masters that don't bother playing with that just to keep things simplified. And it's important to understand this five feet is one square measurement for any time that you've got powers or spells or something that have a range required or if you're shooting a bow or doing something else along these lines. As the dungeon master, it's part of your job to be able to count that distance. So get good at counting in increments of five and 10. As another detail for moving around the battlefield, I think I mentioned before putting things like difficult terrain on the, on the map. This can be things like scattered stones or destroyed rubble or maybe vines or tree 
stumps or whatever, or going up stairs or something like this, some kind of incline. This is all counted as difficult terrain and it just counts as double the movement speed to go across it. So it takes twice as much of your movement speed to cross that section. In short, if you're going to go up five feet of, of difficult terrain, it instead costs 10 feet of your movement instead of the normal five. It's not that big of a deal, you just double count it and it shortens how far a person can move on a given turn. An additional interesting point for movement is if the person has been knocked down, if they are on their butt, sitting on the ground or laying down, it's the condition called prone. Standing up costs half of your movement for the turn. So there's a little bit of a penalty for simply standing up in place. Also on the topic of weird things in the environment, if there's like a tree or some kind of large stump or a small pillar or something like that that your character might want to hide behind, that's called cover and a person gets a small bonus to their armor class for if they're hiding behind it. For partial cover, it's only like a plus two to their armor class. For advanced cover, I think it's more than that. And if they're completely consumed by the cover, they can't be subject to attacks. So this is a useful thing for helping players to differentiate and change things up when they're on the battlefield and get a little bit more of a defensive advantage. A last thing that's important to know for movement is a common action that people might want to take. We'll talk about action economy in the next segment right now, but an action that you can take is the dash move. And what that lets you do is it lets you for your action spend your whole turn moving additional uh, additional feet. If you got the uh, the typical 30 feet of movement on a turn, you can move 30 feet in that turn. If you then take the dash action, you can go your movement speed again on that turn to move another 30 feet. This happens a lot for characters that are specifically melee centric and have to spend the time moving, simply moving into range. They'll spend whole turns just moving. So be ready for people to take the dash action. It's a fairly common one. So the third part to talk about is attacking each other. How do you actually fight when you're in combat? You've got your battle map already out, you've got your player characters with their miniatures, you've got the monsters miniatures and they're arranged relative to one another and they're moving around the battlefield and whatnot and you want to actually fight each other. The way that you do so is by using your action economy. All characters in the game, whether they're player characters or monsters or NPCs or whatever, have three types of actions that they can take on their turn or once per round. These three actions are the regular action, just called an action, the bonus action, and the reaction. And it's important to know that the bonus action is not just another action, it's actually its own kind of action. So think of them as being three different types of actions. Regular action, bonus action, reaction. On your turn, you're going to, you're going to be able to take your regular action and your bonus action and you can move on your turn up to your normal movement speed. For your reaction, you can take it either on your turn or on other people's turns or whatever. Reactions are very specific things. You can only do specific powers with your reaction. And so you'll look at your character sheet and you look at the kinds of powers that you have and it'll specify reaction. If you've got those, then you can use reactions. Otherwise, the things that you're going to pay attention to most on your characters are your action and your bonus action. Okay. And all characters have all three of these once per turn. So let's say that you want to attack each other with like a melee weapon or a ranged weapon or something. Just like making a skill check, you're going to have your players make an attack roll. They roll their d20, they add their bonus to their attack modifier from their character sheet, and they're going to compare it against the monster's armor class. Or if you're attacking them, you compare it against the player's armor class. If it meets or exceeds, then the attack hits and you go ahead and do damage. You usually roll to determine how much damage based on the kind of weapon or what the monster's stat block says or whatever, but the damage is dealt if the attack hits. Otherwise, you can be doing magic spells, which can either use an attack style thing, like a melee weapon or a ranged weapon, at which point you do it just the same with a d20, add the modifier to it and compare it against their armor class. Or other kinds of spells use a saving throw, where instead of using an attack roll, you just say, I'm casting the spell against you, and the enemy, the person who is receiving the spell, has to save against the spell effect. The spell effect will have a DC, a difficulty class, just like any other skill check, associated with it, and the person who is de defending against the spell rolls a d20, adds the appropriate save modifier for it, and sees whether or not they succeed or fail on the save. And then you just look at the spell effect to see what kinds of things saving versus failing happens for when they when they are uh, on these, one of these saving throws. 
You also have the ability to interact with objects on your turn using your action economy. Now this one's kind of cool for 5th edition. 5th edition basically says that if you are moving at the same time, it's presumed that you can do some kind of minor level of object interaction. Pull something out of a bag, grab something off of a table, interact with a door, do something like this. You don't need to have an explicit action to be able to do these kinds of things. Most people like to assert kind of an additional thing for if you're going to do something that's involved, like if you're going to try to pick something up off of the ground, or if you're going to try to actuate on a strong lever or something like this, that that will take a full action in addition to whatever your normal movement is going to look like. But that kind of comes down to the individual dungeon master. Something else to be mindful of in the arena of movement are opportunity attacks. Now this can be a little bit funky for anybody who hasn't actually played a role-playing game before, but what this basically means is any time that a monster or a character, a player character, character is standing next to someone else and they're kind of fighting with each other or whatever, if one of them decides to move outside of the attack radius of their a person that they were standing next to, that person gets to take a, an attack called an opportunity attack on the person that's walking away. It's, it's a little bit weird. It's done for balancing purposes to help make it so that when people get in uh, close to one another, that there's kind of a penalty for trying to disengage or for being the first person to try to walk away from combat. Any which way, the way that it goes is your reaction is spent to make an opportunity attack whenever someone walks outside of your melee attack range. So be aware of that. That's going to happen a lot in the game. And that's about it. You're going to be using your actions to throw attacks attacks at each other or to cast magic at one another. Be mindful of range on the battlefield for where you need to be in order to be able to cast these things. And then note down the effects of when damage is taken. If you're fighting against, if you're attacking your players, your players need to notice, need to write down when they're taking their damage and take it away from their current hit points or whatever. If they're attacking your monsters, write it down on the little piece of paper that you've declared for your monster so that you have the notes of how, of how long it's going to take for the monster to reach its own death. Now there's other things that are worth noting here. Special effects or conditions can be applied for if your character is going to knock somebody down or a cast a magic spell to put them to sleep or give them disadvantage for a couple of turns or something. Whenever these effects take place in the game, just make note of it on the sheet. A lot of people like to have this round tracker system for both monitoring initiative as well as taking note of whenever special effects are happening. Other people like to put special markers on their miniatures for denoting when some kind of special effect has happened. You can use whatever system works for you, I use a combination of both of those. I also just generally keep it in my mind of whatever is happening, and the players are also usually pretty good about reminding you, oh, that guy is blinded right now, that guy is grappled right now, etc. Write these things down, just keep track of them. It is worth mentioning, because grappling happens a lot, that for these kinds of effects you'll regularly run into a contested skill check, and this is when you say that the uh, for a grapple case, if someone wants to go and take a hold of somebody else, it is a grappling check. The person who wants to grapple grab them, makes a uh, strength check, strength athletics usually, and then that is going to be compared, instead of comparing it against a flat total, a normal difficulty class like a regular skill check, it's compared against another role, an opposing role by the defender. The defender then also rolls either, an acro uh, either an, a strength athletics check or an acrobatics check to try and resist the grappling effect, and whoever has the higher roll total between the two ends up winning. The grappler succeeds on the grapple, or the person manages to get away. If the person is already grappled, you can do the same thing to break free of the grapple. So get ready for those kinds of contested checks where people are doing this roll off to determine who's going to win in that contested situation. There's one more thing that's also important to keep in mind here. When you are taking damage, when any creature is taking damage, you need to be mindful of if they have a concentration based spell effect. This really only applies to magic, so if you're not dealing with a, with a monster or a player character that uses magic, don't sweat it. But a number of spells in the game are concentrated oriented and it says so on the spell description. If a character is maintaining concentration on a spell, so it's lasting for multiple rounds and they're keeping it up as an active effect, if they take damage they need to make what's called a concentration check to see if they can continue to hold concentration despite having just been brained with a skill, with, with a club or something else along these lines. A concentration check is real easy. All that you do is make a constitution saving throw and the, the difficulty class for it is either 10 
one or it's half of the damage that was dealt to the creature depending on which one is higher which means if you're taking a big shot then yeah it can be difficult to make that concentration check and the spellcaster can lose the spell if they fail that save if they make the save they make the constitution check then they get to keep the spell no big deal and the last statement for running combat is when does it end right you're going to continue doing this round robin initiative based system taking one players or, or monsters turn at a time and doing this rotation style thing when does it end this usually it ends when people die either the player characters or the monsters die and hopefully it should be the monsters that are dying if this is if you're running this correctly and if players are, are making intelligent decisions for themselves but basically track the different hit point totals for player characters and for monsters usually for new dungeon masters the players will track their hit points themselves that's not usually something that you need to worry about you've got plenty of other things to be managing at the same time but you need to track your monsters hit points and whenever anybody player character or monster reaches zero hit points they die now for a regular monster they usually just perish right they just die the player characters kill them it's no big deal player characters do have the option in fifth edition if they're using a melee weapon to knock the creature unconscious instead of killing them if they want to go more of a humane avenue or if they want to take a prisoner or something like that so that's something you can always do but otherwise for, for a monster when it reaches zero hit points it perishes now players operate a little bit differently because you are the heroes of the story you kind of want to have an ability to come back or kind of get a second chance or something if you go down so the way that it works is this when you get reduced to zero hit points prior versions of the game use negative hit points but fifth edition does away from all that so it's real simple when you get reduced to zero hit points your character is knocked unconscious or is incapacitated and is knocked on the floor bleeding or something else you can't speak you can't do anything you can't move nothing right you're on the ground and fate is now being tested for whether or not you're going to die there or if you're going to be able to stabilize and come back or something you are called what's you're, you are what is called unstable okay now on your turn you're going to start making what are called death saves all right and the way that these work are as follows you're going to roll a d20 and you're trying to make the difficulty class of 10. you don't add anything to it it is just a 50 50 i think technically it's 55 45 but it is just a 50 50 shot of whether or not you pass the death save or fail the death save and what happens is if you accrue three saves from your death saves then you are automatically stabilized and you are at zero hit points but you are not in threat of dying okay you're naturally stabilized and you just sit there until you can naturally recover or somebody can come help you and notice because that takes three successful death saves this can happen over three turns minimum okay but if you fail if you get three failed death death saves you die your character is done you're kaput you need to be resurrected if you're going to come back or you're making a new character and so on each of your turns you make a death save and that's the only thing that you can do on that turn and it can take up to five different turns for this to resolve now this gives your friends a lot of time to now turn around and try to cast a healing spell on you or force a healing potion down your throat or something else along these lines to help pick you up but this is the now tension that happens when a player character falls to zero hit points okay the other things that are worth noting on here is if another monster tries to attack you or if you take damage from some kind of environmental effect or whatever it counts as an automatic death fail death save fail okay so it adds one to your fail count and pushes you one step closer down the death track what's worse is if a monster actively attacks you it's considered an automatic critical hit for two failed death saves okay so as a new dungeon master as an aspiring dungeon master you know that if you really want to crank up the difficulty or start taking characters out or help communicate to your players that you're out for blood and that you might be killing somebody <laughs> on this combat you want them to take it seriously attack player characters while they're on the ground because it counts as two failed death saves it really escalates things real quickly another thing to understand for a dungeon master and to help communicate this to your players too is that fleeing is perfectly okay most monsters in the world won't necessarily fight to the death and then you know they're not just a glory or death monster a lot of them if they're in a group or in a band upon seeing one or two of their members fall they'll run goblins will flee orcs will flee they want to they want to live to loot another day and that's fine same thing with the player characters the player characters might decide that they're they don't have the stuff to take on this particular battle and they want to run away that's cool that's a part of the narrative give them their normal exp for that or whatever else you know let them do it fleeing should be a normal part of combat and it should be considered a successful resolution so once combat's done and your characters have either uh won the day 
away, they're victorious, or if they had to run or something else, drop back out of the, the initiative system, go back to normal role-playing, storytelling style, where you kind of do things free form among your group, and continue play as normal. It's pretty typical right now for the players to want to go and loot the bodies of whatever the monsters or bandits or whoever it was that they fought up against, and try to get a little bit of treasure or something for it. If you're running from one of the adventure modules, it will tell you what each of these creatures has in their possession when they die, or if there's some kind of magic items in the vicinity that they can go pick up from a chest or something else along these lines. Now is the time to give them that loot and to continue telling the story. Now, the other thing that you want to pay attention to here is your experience points, and different people have different ways of awarding EXP. Some people like doing the strict mathematical style where every character, every monster, or whoever that was in the battle, regardless of whether or not you uh, killed the creature or if you forced them to flee or something else or if you ran on your own where each one is worth a, a exp total and you sum it up divide it up among your players etc that's a way you can do it that's fine that's a way that a lot of people like to do it i suggest if you are just getting started now don't sweat that that's a whole bunch of math that you don't really need to do you can use the different kind of exp system which is called the milestone system which is if you accomplish something significant then you get a level or you get half of a level or something like that. And I always give my EXP to my players after the game so you're not worrying about spending time in game figuring out what abilities they're picking up and rolling hit dice and whatever else for, for these kinds of things. Do all of that outside of the game so you're not bogging down the game table mid play. If you want some guidelines for doing milestone based things, fortunately, if you're running one of the adventure modules, it's listed in there for the most part. It will say once this boss is dead, you've, you have achieved something significant and go ahead and award your players enough EXP to get to the next level. If you are running an adventure module, I wouldn't change it though. Keep it to what's listed in the adventure module because the adventure module is tuned to assume the leveling pace that's specified. Because this doesn't really fit in most any other places, after your characters finish a combat, if, this, if the environment is a safe place for them to sit and stay, they may want to do something that 5th edition added to the game called a short rest, where you take about an hour to kind of patch up your wounds, bandage up any little cuts or stitches that you might need to do, eat a little bit of food, and kind of get yourself recovered and ready before you head out somewhere. It is presumed that this takes approximately an hour of in-game time, but a bunch of their characters, a bunch of your player characters are going to have abilities that recharge on a short rest, so it's it's a good idea for you, the storyteller, to kind of presume that these things are going to happen or to actively ask your players if they're going to take a short rest. There is also the long rest that you can take, the off chance that we haven't talked about it much here on this channel. And a long rest is basically the same thing as going to sleep, though if you're out of doors or in some kind of uh, unsafe situation or you're out in the wilderness, your characters may want to take watch and do that kind of thing. I have another video where I talk about the concept of taking watch and how you should, how you how I think that you should run that in your game. There's a little bit of homebrew stuff there where I turn up the difficulty setting a little bit, but I'll put a link for that one here in the comments. So that's it. That's the third pillar of adventure. Sure, that's combat in a nutshell. Yes, there's more details and more specifics that you'll learn as you go and different kinds of actions and conditions and things, but you've got time to learn it. This should give you enough of a framework that you can now get started running your game. Since this is the third and final pillar, if you'll remember what I told you way back at the beginning of us embarking on my Dungeon Mastery 100 series, I said that being a Dungeon Master boils down to doing three things exploration, social role-playing, and combat. Now that you've got the basics of how to do each of these things, you are ready to sit down, plan what you're going to do for your first session, and actually run it. You're, you're ready to go. You've got all the rules that you need to know. You've got all of the preps and all of the tips that you'll need to actually get started. Go run a game. Go have some fun with it. If you have any specific questions about a module that you are running, especially for you new dungeon masters out there, consider me a resource. I'll be very happy to give you feedback or suggestions or things that you might want to pay attention attention to or something. You can either leave me a comment here. You can chat me up over on social media. I'm really active on Twitter, so you can come find me at Titan Bear Gaming. I would love to help you out there. Consider me a resource. I'm here for you. Now, all of my Dungeon Mastery videos so far have been centered on running a pre-written adventure, running a pre-written module, which I do recommend for new Dungeon Masters first getting started. But you may find that even after just one, you're ready to write your own stuff. Some of the next videos that, I'll do, that I will do will be on homebrew and writing your own material, writing your own narratives. How do you do it? What are the considerations to be taken into account? All of these things will get there. I do have a couple of player side videos that I want to do next, including the primer for doing advanced roleplay or even just basic 
role play that I'd like to get to. And so I think I'll probably take a break and switch to go onto the player side for a little while, but look forward to the homebrew videos. They will be coming out. I'm a big fan of homebrew. So with that, I declare you a graduated dungeon master. Go on, go out, start playing with your friends, start learning how this goes at the table. You're ready to go and come back and let me know how it's going. All right, I'll always be here for you. So otherwise, like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, pay attention to some of the other Dungeon Mastery videos that we've done. If you're just joining us, joining with us now, go watch the rest of them. They make a pretty good series. And otherwise, next time I see you, have more fun, would you? It's good for you.